Hello, and welcome to USSC Live, the United States Sentencing Commission's series of interactive webcasts produced in conjunction with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts and the Federal Judicial Center. This edition of USSC Live will provide you with an update on what is happening in federal sentencing. I'm Krista Rubin. Today's program will focus on three main topics. First, we will provide you with an update on the Commission's recent data series, Quick Facts. Glenn Schmidt from the Office of Research and Data will join my colleague, Rachel Pierce, to discuss highlights from this data series. The next segment of the program will focus on a hot guideline application issue calculating the drug quantity for a controlled substance not listed in the drug guideline. Richard Bolkin, Supervisory U.S. Probation Officer, will be joining us live via video teleconference from Albuquerque to discuss this issue. Finally, the last segment of the program will focus on activities during the Commission's 2013-2014 amendment cycle. Judge Patty Saris, Chair of the Sentencing Commission, will join us to talk about some of the highlights of this amendment cycle. We'll start with a look at new Commission data. Rachel? Thanks, Krista. Joining us now is the Director of the Office of Research and Data at the Sentencing Commission, Glenn Schmidt. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. The Commission has been working on making our rich data on federal sentencing more readily available to the public on our website at www.ussc.gov. Now, one of the ways the Commission is making more of our data available is with a new series of publications called Quick Facts. Glenn, what are these Quick Facts? Well, Rachel, the Quick Facts publications are a series that will give an overview of and highlight data about particular federal offenses and related sentencing issues. They give readers the basic facts about a single area of federal crime in an easy-to-read two-page format. The first Quick Facts were released in August 2013, and as of March 2014, we will have released a total of 10 Quick Facts publications. Now, Glenn, what are the sentencing topics that are addressed in these publications? Well, we currently have four Quick Facts addressing drug trafficking offenses. These focus on drug types that have been in the news a lot lately. There are drug trafficking crimes involving oxycodone, heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana. We also have released quick facts addressing economic crimes, illegal entry offenses, national defense offenses, and mandatory minimums. Two additional quick facts address firearms offenses. The first of those looks at felon in possession offenses, and the second looks at violations of 18 United States Code 924, which involves using or possessing a firearm in connection with a drug trafficking offense or a crime of violence. Now, Glenn, you mentioned that one of the quick facts focuses on mandatory minimum penalties, which obviously has been creating a lot of discussion in Congress mm -hmm. as of late. Uh, what can you tell us about mandatory minimum penalties? Well, the quick facts on mandatory minimum summarizes data from the Commission's larger report on this subject, which was released in October 2011. It might surprise many of the viewers to know that only one in four federal offenders are convicted of an offense that carries a mandatory minimum penalty. The cases that do involve these penalties are generally drug trafficking and firearms cases. It might also surprise some viewers to learn that only half of these offenders remain subject to any mandatory minimum penalty at the time of sentencing, as many of them are relieved of the mandatory penalty through their substantial assistance to the government in the investigation or prosecution of another offender, or because they qualify for, for relief from the penalty under a statutory provision commonly called the safety valve, which is designed to benefit low-level, nonviolent offenders with little to no prior criminal history. Now, receiving relief from a mandatory minimum penalty can make a significant difference in the punishment imposed. For example, of the offenders who were convicted of an offense carrying a mandatory minimum penalty, those who re received some type of relief from the penalty had sentences that were, on average, less than half as long as those who remained subject to the penalty at the time of sentencing. Mm -hmm. Now, Glenn, regarding the quick facts on the various drug offenses, uh, what findings would you like to highlight for our viewers today? Well, Rachel, each of our Quick Facts publications on drug offenses is organized in the same way. We first tell the reader about who the offenders are and a little about how they committed the crime. Then we describe the punishments imposed and finally, how the sentencing guidelines were used to determine the punishment. Let's look at the Quick Facts on, on methamphetamine offenses as an example. Mm -hmm. 
Almost one in five federal drug trafficking offenses involves methamphetamine. Most meth offenders were men, and the racial makeup of these offenders was about evenly split between white offenders and Hispanics. More than two-thirds of these offenders were U.S. citizens, and more than half of these offenders had little or no prior criminal history. The median quantity of drugs that was trafficked in these cases was between 3.3 and 11 pounds of the drug. In about 15% of the cases, the offender was eligible to receive a high sentence because a weapon was involved in the offense. The average sentence for these cases was 92 months, making it second only to crack cocaine trafficking cases in offense severity. 32% of the offenders had a sentence of 10 years or longer. Mandatory minimum penalties come into play at some point in over 80% of meth cases. However, by the time of sentencing, almost two-thirds of meth offenders were no longer subject to a mandatory penalty. Now, Glenn, what other interesting findings are revealed in these publications? Well, Rachel, I think our viewers will find something interesting in each of the publications, and I can say that the Commission's research staff has certainly found that to be true as we have put them together. But I think that viewers might find the recent quick facts on firearms offenses under Section 924C to be particularly interesting. That law requires judges to impose a mandatory minimum penalty when an offender possesses, brandishes, or discharges a firearm while he is committing a crime of violence or a drug trafficking crime. In fiscal year 2012, there were more than 2,000 convictions for this offense. Virtually all of these offenders were men, and most were U.S. citizens. Unlike other crimes, the offenders convicted of these crimes were much likely, much more likely to have a prior criminal conviction. In fact, almost 12% of them were deemed to be career offenders under federal law, a status that enhances their punishment. Mm -hmm. The penalties for persons convicted under this section varied widely, as might be expected given that the statute calls for different lengths of minimum punishments depending on the conduct involved in the offense. The average sentence in these cases is long, at 165 months. But if the offender was convicted of another offense along with this one, such as the crime that he or she committed while using the weapon, the punishments get even longer, from between 132 to 181 months depending on whether a mandatory minimum penalty for the other crime was required. And in a small number of cases, offenders are convicted of multiple counts of violating, violating Section 924C. The statute allows for these punishments to be stacked so they are served consecutively. When offenders were convicted of multiple counts of the section, the average sentence was 358 months, which is almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now, Glenn, can you give us a sneak preview of future things that we'll find in the Quick Facts? I'd be happy to. In the next few weeks, we'll be releasing Quick Facts publications on career offenders, on alien smuggling offenses, and women offenders. And then later this year, we'll have an entire series on fraud offenses, focusing on the various types of fraud, such as securities fraud, healthcare fraud, and mortgage fraud. Okay, one last thing. What new commission data can our viewers expect to see in the coming months? The Commission will release its 2013 data in the next few days with the release of the Commission's annual report and 2013 Sourcebook of Federal Sentencing Statistics. Also, the Commission will release the sentencing impact estimates for the proposed amendments this year. And then look for an update to our online interactive sourcebook in the next week or so, which is going to be very exciting. Yes, that is going to be very exciting. We'll have to have you back on a future broadcast to share some of that, that new data with us. Thank you Great. very much for being here today. It's been my pleasure. Krista? Our next segment will focus on a hot guideline application issue. Joining us live via video teleconference is Richard Bolkin, Supervisory Probation Officer from the District of New Mexico. Richard is also the 10th Circuit Representative on the Commission's Probation Officer Advisory Group. Hello, Richard, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Krista. Now, you're here today to discuss an issue that we've been hearing a lot about. Um, and this is one of the more frequent questions we receive on our helpline and during training programs. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about it. Um, recently, we've been seeing, and, and as a circuit representative for the probation officers advisory group to the Sentencing Commission, we've been hearing about and talking about an issue involving the calculation of the drug guideline. Um, as you know, more and more often we are seeing cases that involve controlled substances that are not listed in the drug guideline. 
Now, Richard, in what types of drug cases are you seeing this issue come into play? Uh, we are seeing this issue primarily for cases in which the DEA has emergency scheduled a new substance under the statute. Um, these recent designer drugs include Spice, K2, other synthetic cannabinoids, Molly, bath salts. Um, and in these cases, the court is required to choose the most closely related controlled substance since the substance is not listed in the guideline. What guidance can you give us regarding the process the court must undertake to find the appropriate base offense level in these cases? Well, Richard, as you pointed out, there is an application note in the drug guideline, 2D1.1, that requires the court to determine the most analogous controlled substance in a situation where the controlled substance is not listed at 2D1.1. And that application note is application note six. Now this note instructs the court to determine the base offense level using the marijuana equivalency of the most closely related controlled substance referenced in this guideline. Often the parties have different opinions as to what the most closely related controlled substance in a particular case are. Absolutely. Well, let's first, before we get into that, let's first take a look at what application note six requires. So looking at application note six, it first states that in the case of a controlled substance that is not specifically referenced in this guideline, the base offense level is to be determined by using the marijuana equivalency of the most closely related controlled substance. Now the a application note goes on to say that in making the determination of what is the most closely related controlled substance to the unlisted drug, the court shall, to the extent practicable, consider three factors in determining the most closely related controlled substance. Now first, the first factor, the court should consider whether the controlled substance not referenced in the guideline has a chemical structure that is substantially similar to a controlled substance that is referenced in the guideline. Second, the court will consider whether the controlled substance not referenced in the guideline has a stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect on the central nervous system that is substantially similar to the stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect on the central nervous system of a controlled substance that is referenced in the guideline. And then third, the final factor is whether a lesser or greater quantity of the controlled substance not referenced in the drug guideline, is needed to produce a substantially similar effect on the central nervous system as a controlled substance that is referenced in the guideline. What resources are available to assist us in the application of these factors? And what information can we look to in determining whether a controlled substance not listed in the, in the guideline, for example, um, uh, a chemical structure uh, substantially similar to another controlled substance listed in the guideline? Well, the best place to start would be with the DEA. Um, they have publications on their website which may be helpful. And of course you can also call the DEA directly to get information about which controlled substance would be closely related to the substance not listed in the guidelines. And as you mentioned when we started, the defense may have an expert that will provide the court with what their analysis of what the most closely related controlled substance is in a particular case. Now, once the court, after considering the factors listed in application note six, identify the most closely related controlled substance for the unlisted controlled substance, does the court then make a determination whether the marijuana equivalency is appropriate. Um, in other words, let's say the court determines that in a drug case that the most closely related controlled substance is an unlisted synthetic cannabinoid to an unlisted uh, synthetic cannabinoid is synthetic THC. Um, the marijuana equivalency for synthetic THC is one to 167 grams. Can the court then make the determination that the equivalency should be 1 to 80? 
given the factors listed in application note six? Well, you know, Richard, application note six lists the factors, as we just discussed, that the court is to use to determine the most closely related controlled substance to a controlled substance not listed in 2D1.1. Now, once the court, after looking at the factors in application note six, determines the most closely related substance, the court will use the marijuana equivalency for that closely related controlled substance to determine the offense level for the unlisted controlled substance. So in your hypothetical, if the court determines that the most closely related controlled substance in a synthetic cannabinoid case is synthetic THC, the court will use the marijuana equivalency of one to 167 grams. So in other words, if the court were to extrapolate from that marijuana equivalency and use a different equivalency other than what is provided in the drug equivalency table, that would constitute a departure from the guidelines. Do you have any last Thanks, questions Krista. for us? Do you have any spe specific guidance on which substances are analogous in, say, a synthetic cannabinoid case? And, and what about bath salts or molly? Well, it's a good question. The commission does not have a specific position on the most closely related controlled substance for molly, bath salts, or synthetic cannabinoids. I mean, we can certainly point, point you to application note six at the drug guideline. And of course, as with any guideline application decision, the final determination is up to the court. Um, and you, know, you also may wanna look and see if there's any case law on the issue. Richard, thank you so much for joining us today and discussing this hot Thanks guideline application me, with you with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Krista. It has been a busy, exciting, and productive year at the Commission. Last September, the Commission held an economic crime symposium at John Jay College. In October, the Commission held a recidivism roundtable. One of the Commission's multi-year priorities is to conduct a recidivism study of federal offenders. Staff has met with experts in the areas of these studies to discuss best practices to conduct such an analysis. Right now, the Commission is almost at the end of the 2013-2014 amendment cycle. In January, the Commission published in the Federal Register proposed amendments to the Federal Sentencing Guidelines, which are drawn from the final proposed priorities that the Commission identified in August of 2013. A copy of the reader-friendly version of these proposed amendments can be found on the Commission's website. The proposed amendments address several sentencing issues, including new legislation, circuit conflicts, and other miscellaneous guideline issues. In February, the Commission held a public hearing on recent legislation, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. And just two weeks ago, the Commission held its annual public hearing on policy issues. To help us talk about the Commission's priorities for the 2013-2014 amendment cycle is Judge Patty Saris, Chief Judge of the District of Massachusetts and Chairperson of the United States Sentencing Commission since December of 2010. I'm so pleased to have you with us today, Judge Saris. And I'm pleased to be with you and to talk about what's happening at the Sentencing Commission. The Commission has identified as a major priority this year finding ways to reduce the costs of federal incarceration and to address the overcapacity of federal prisons. Now, Judge, in addition to the problem with prison overcrowding, how has uh, this affected the federal budget? At the same time as federal prisons exceed capacity, the nation's budget crisis has become acute. The overall Department of Justice budget has decreased in recent years, meaning that as more resources are needed for prisons, fewer are available for other key components of the criminal justice system. And what has the Commission done to help with this problem? One of the steps we've taken is to try to address this important issue by supporting legislation in Congress to limit mandatory minimum penalties for federal drug offenses. Now, in 2011, the Commission released a major report on mandatory minimums which found that these penalties have contributed to the overall rise in the federal prison population. For example, the report found that certain severe mandatory minimum penalties can lead to disparate charging decisions by prosecutors. Yes, that is true. Filing notice under Section 851 of Title 21 of the United States Code for Drug Offenders with prior felony convictions generally doubles 
the applicable mandatory minimum sentence. Our report found very different prosecutorial charging practices with respect to this Section 851 notice from district to district. So, in six districts, more than 75% of eligible defendants receive the increased mandatory minimum penalty for a prior conviction, while in eight other districts, none of the eligible offenders received it. Now, Judge, let's talk more specifically about the legislation that the Commission is supporting. Uh, what is the name of the legislation and who is supporting the bill or sponsoring the bill? Last month, the Senate Judiciary Committee considered the Smarter Sentencing Act, a bill that corresponds to all of the recommendations in the Commission's mandatory minimum report. The Smarter Sentencing Act was introduced by a bipartisan group of senators led by Senators Durbin, Lee, and Leahy. The Judiciary Committee reported the Smarter Sentencing Act with even more bipartisan support, including from Senators Cruz, Flake, Feinstein, and White House. Now, why don't you tell us what the highlights of the Smarter Sentencing Act are? As reported, the bill does three things. One, reduces mandatory minimum penalties for drug trafficking offenders from the current levels of 5, 10, and 20 years to new levels of 2, 5, and 10 years. Second, it expands the safety valve to most offenders with up to two criminal history points from the current level of one criminal history point. And last, it makes the Fair Sentencing Act retroactive. We are gratified to see progress in the Senate on this priority and will continue to work to support congressional action. Now, Judge, why don't you tell us what the Commission is doing this amendment cycle in the area of drug sentencing? The Commission is acting to re-examine drug sentences during the 2013 to 2014 amendment cycle. This year, the Commission proposed an amendment to the guidelines which would reduce by two levels the base offense levels for drug trafficking offenses that correspond to specified drug quantities in the guidelines across all drug types. The proposed amendment is still under consideration by the Commission. And how would you characterize this amendment? The proposed amendment would be a more modest change than those that Congress is considering. Only Congress can change statutory mandatory minimum penalties. The changes the Commission has proposed would continue to link guideline sentences to existing mandatory minimum penalties, but would place the guideline ranges for those offenders with no criminal history at the mandatory minimum level rather than above it, where the current guidelines are now. And why is the Commission considering this now? There are several reasons. First, the Commission's previous work studying recidivism of offenders con convicted of distributing crack offenses who were released under the Commission's 2007 amendment showed over a two-year period that those offenders had a similar recidivism rate as crack offenders who were not released early. We also found that the crack amendment did not cause few fewer amendment, uh, offenders to plead guilty or decrease the rate of substantial assistance. Any other reasons? Yes, Rachel. There have been several major changes over the years since the drug quantity table was set at its current levels that have contributed to the Commission's decision to re-examine those offense levels. When the drug guidelines were first promulgated in 1987, they contained only one enhancement. Now there are 14 different enhancements, some mandated by statute. So these enhancements increase sentences for the most serious offenders. Because of these changes, drug quantity may not need to carry as much weight in ensuring adequate sentences are imposed for more serious offenders. What about the impact of the safety valve? The guidelines were originally set above the mandatory minimums to provide some incentive for lower level offenders to plead. Subsequently, though, Congress created the safety valve which provides a much greater incentive for lower level offenders to plead and then bypass the mandatory minimum penalty entirely. Now Judge, what would be the effect if the Commission should decide to promulgate this amendment and reduce the drug guideline by two levels? The effect, though much smaller than what Congress could achieve through legislation, would be significant, as this slide shows. We expect that almost 70 percent of drug trafficking offenders would see their sentences reduced. For those offenders, sentences would decrease by an average of 11 months from 62 to 51 months. Within five years, the federal prison population would be reduced by more than 6,500. Over time, the effects would be much greater. 
Indeed, the offender sentenced in the first year after the change would over time serve almost 14,000 fewer years than they would have without the, char the change. Are there any, uh, any other effects that you would like to highlight for us? Yes. This amendment, if adopted, could also bring the guidelines more in line with the sentences that judges are giving in cases without government motions for a departure. As you can see in the slide, the chart compares the average guideline minimum for offenders at each current base offense level with the sentences actually imposed, excluding those cases where the government asked for a reduced sentence. So as you can see, at many levels, the sentences imposed are below the guideline minimum. Now, so as the, you can see in this chart here, with the, dr with the drug guidelines reduced two levels, um, as in the proposed amendment, as you can see, the sentences currently imposed would match these new guideline levels quite closely. This change reflects our use of judicial data in setting policy. Now, what are the next steps that the Commission will take in this amendment cycle? The Commission will consider the public comment it has received, and we have received <laughs> boxes and boxes and boxes of it, right. um, which we're all reading. Yeah. We recently held a public hearing where we heard from many interested parties on this issue. We will take all of this information into consideration and all the other issues um, that we hear about and vote in April. We will submit the amendments to Congress by May 1st. Congress will then have six months in which it can dis disapprove of any amendment. If Congress does not act, the amendments go into effect on November 1st. Thank you very much for participating today. Uh, we look forward to having you back on a future webcast. I look forward to it as well. Thanks for having me. I welcome the opportunity to discuss the important issues being addressed by the Sentencing Commission. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel and Judge Saris. Last year, Congress passed the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, which, in addition to other changes, modified federal criminal statutes, most notably the federal assault statute. These changes were intended in large part to address domestic violence in Native American communities, a large-scale problem which has received significant attention in recent weeks. The Commission held an informative hearing on this issue on February the 13th. The Commission heard from a federal judge, senior Justice Department officials, and a federal public defender all with experience in Indian country prosecutions. As Judge Saris mentioned, the Commission held an additional hearing on March 13th. During this hearing, there were people who also testified on the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. Here's a clip of the Honorable Kirk G. Sanook. We've had more success in dealing with DV crimes the longer we can maintain either on probation uh, supervision over individuals who have been convicted of domestic violence, this is less likely that they're going to commit again. We've got an extensive batteries treatment program. We send most of our people through so they can go that. And then, like I said, it decreases the chance that they're going to commit a domestic crime, a domestic violence crime in the future. Experts on domestic violence and victims' issues also testified and provided information about suffocation and strangulation. These perspectives will be immensely helpful as the Commission decides how best to implement this significant new law. The remaining proposed amendments address circuit conflicts and miscellaneous guideline issues. We've already mentioned the proposed amendments regarding drug offenses and the Violence Against Women's Act. As you can see on this graphic, Three of the proposed amendments address the resolution of circuit conflicts under guidelines 1B1.10, which is reductions in terms of imprisonment as a result of an amended guideline range, 2K2.1, the felon in possession guideline, and 5D1.2, the guideline addressing terms of supervised release to be imposed. Also under consideration are miscellaneous guideline application issues involving guideline 2L1.1, addressing smuggling, harboring, and transporting unlawful aliens, and guideline 5G1.3, which addresses defendants who are serving undischarged terms of imprisonment. All of these issues were discussed at the Commission's public hearing on March 13th. 
let's take a look at some highlights of our probation officer advisory group chair, Terry Brantley, who's testifying on the proposed felon in possession amendment. Uh, POEG asked if we could comment on this particular amendment, proposed amendment. Um, we look at these things, as you know, from an application point of view. What kind of application issues might arise, intended or otherwise, under some of these uh, proposals? In this one, we could not reach consensus as to option number two. Um, the majority of the folks on POEG liked option number two because they felt like that was the, um, the, the way that we should be applying them in terms of the relevant conduct analysis that we do all the time across cover to cover of the guidelines. But there were a couple who uh, still felt and expressed concerns that you've already heard from other members of this panel about bringing in conduct wholly unrelated to the, the possession charge and, and having a person charged with felon in possession end up being sentenced for something different. Um, now we make no we make no comment as to whether or whether or not it should or should not be that way, um, but for that reason we couldn't reach consensus on option number two. A recording of this public hearing, as well as the agenda and written testimony, is also available on the commission's website, www.ussc.gov. So, what's next? As Judge Saris mentioned the commission will continue to consider and deliberate on the proposed amendments. Remember, these amendments are still proposed and have not yet been promulgated. The commission will meet in April to vote on the promulgation of each of the proposed amendments. If the commission votes to promulgate a particular proposed amendment, the commission will submit that amendment to Congress no later than May the 1st. The amendments will go into effect on November 1st, 2014, unless Congress passes legislation before that date to reject an amendment. So, stay tuned for an update in May for the amendments sent to Congress. We will be conducting training on all these amendments once final amendments are issued. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We'd like to thank Judge Saris, Glenn, and Richard for visiting with us. We've updated you on recent commission business related to this year's proposed amendments. We've highlighted some new commission data and provided some guidance on a hot guidelines issue. Thanks again to our viewers for joining us. Please take a moment and give us some feedback on this webcast. Also, don't forget to let us know if you have any suggestions for future webcast topics. See you next time.